Ethereum is a massive failure as a cryptocurrency. Bitcoin is the only true hard money and reliable store of value. You know, the institutions are never going to buy Ethereum because it has an infinite supply and it's no better than fiat money that's randomly just printed out of thin air on a whim. Does any of that sound familiar to you? Well, I hear these kinds of criticisms all the time about Ethereum, but here's the truth. The world is testing the hypothesis that cryptocurrencies can be used as a reliable store of value. And if in fact they can be, then Ethereum might be just as reliable as Bitcoin and might even be better. So I want to lay out some reasons why in this video as a blockchain developer who works the Ethereum protocol on a daily basis. And full disclosure, you know, I hold both Bitcoin and Ethereum in my portfolio. So I want to let you know where I stand before I present this information. So before we get into that, you know, if you're new around here, hey, I'm Gregory. And on this channel, I turn you into a blockchain master. So if that's something that you're interested in, then smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to this channel. And if you want to learn how to master blockchain step by step from start to finish, then head on over to dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp to get started today. So let's get into some of these criticisms of Ethereum. So what is a store of value? Well, it's any asset that maintains its value rather than depreciating. We have gold, precious metals, any nation's currency has to be a reliable store of value in order for the economy to function smoothly. And one of the things we're testing right now is can cryptocurrency be used as an alternative store of value and can it even be a better one? This is one of the biggest narratives around Bitcoin right now, that it's a good store of value for lots of reasons. Number one, it has a finite supply of 21 million Bitcoin. In other words, there will never be any more than 21 million Bitcoin in existence. It has a capped supply. It's digitally scarce, so you know that no two people can own the same Bitcoin or double spend it or anything like that. And it has a decreasing issue and schedule. We have halving events every few years that slow the rate of Bitcoin production until we reach this maximum total supply of 21 million Bitcoin. But Ethereum, on the other hand, doesn't work that way. You know, if you go look at the chart here, you can see that it has an infinite supply. And for that reason, it can't be a reliable store of value compared to Bitcoin. People will say that Bitcoin is a better hard money that's a good store of value against inflation, right? They don't like, you know, fiat money that's printed on a whim. And that ETH is no better because, you know, the supply is just infinite. You know, it can, it can be increased by however much they want to, but not so fast. There's a lot more to it. Let me tell you why. So first of all, let's go ahead and clear this up. You can't just print new ETH on a whim. All right. Ethereum actually has a monetary policy. And this governs, you know, how much ETH is issued at what rate, you know, new, new ETH is created. And also, you know, that affects Ethereum's inflation. It's true that Ethereum as it exists today is an inflationary asset with an infinite supply, but long term, the inflation rate goes way down and it trends towards zero. That's because a fixed amount of ETH is produced on an annual basis. And when the supply grows, that means the percentage actually shrinks. Let me use an example to show you what I'm talking about. Let's say you have a supply of 100 apples and you add 10 apples to it per year. Okay, you start off with 100, you add 110. So year one, that would be 10% inflation. You add 10 the next year, that would be 9% because you're still adding 10, but the percentage goes down. And the same for year three, you have 130, you only add 10, and that's 7%. So you can see this number is going up, but the percentage change is going down. And so that's exactly what's happening with the ETH supply right here. Okay, so it's true, it is technically infinite, but the rate of inflation goes down significantly and long term, it could be about 0.5 to 2%. Upcoming protocol changes over the next few years, especially as ETH 2.0 rolls out. So there is some inflation, but it follows a very strict set of rules and it's predictable. And I know what some of you might be thinking, oh, but protocol changes, right? We have to trust this is actually gonna happen. There's centralization here. But I'm gonna talk about later in this video, make sure you stick around. Like, don't think that Bitcoin is immune to protocol changes. And we'll talk about why. So make sure you watch to the end of the video. And here you can see a graph of Ethereum's historical issuance and what's likely to happen as these protocol changes take place. So you can see it's going up like this. Here's the past, here's what's actually recorded in history. And then it's gonna flatline like crazy. The biggest changes to Ethereum's monetary policy is going to be the migration to Ethereum 2.0. All right, so let me explain that. If you use Ethereum today, you're using Ethereum 1.0. But in the future, we're going to do a migration to Ethereum 2.0. That's going to be a new and improved version of the protocol where it gets blockchain really fast, really scalable, ready for prime time. Okay, we're currently a part of this migration right now. At the time of recording this video, we're in phase zero. And over the coming months and the next couple of years, we're going to complete this migration to Ethereum 2.0. So there's lots of big changes coming out with this. You can check out in the videos where I talk about Ethereum 2.0 on my YouTube channel to get the full you know, idea. But one of the biggest things is that we're moving away from proof of work, which Bitcoin has right now, to proof of stake. So this is uh, Ethereum's consensus algorithm. This is how it secures the network. This is how it uh, you know, mines new transactions and includes them into the blockchain. So the biggest change here 
is that the miners get replaced by validators. And so instead of, you know, these uh, computers participating in running the blockchain by solving cryptographic puzzles and earning a mining reward for confirming transactions, people take their Ethereum cryptocurrency and stake it to the network uh, to do that. So you, you run a computer called a validator and you take your Ethereum cryptocurrency and you stake it with your validator to help secure the network instead of just simply having a computer and turning mining on and earning cryptocurrency for doing that. One big reason to introduce this change is to actually reduce the rate that new ETH is issued to basically, you know, bring down Ethereum's inflation. And that's what Vitalik Buterin himself, you know, the mastermind behind Ethereum, uh, has, has said about Ethereum 2.0. One of the reasons we're doing proof of stake is because we want to greatly reduce the issuance. So in the specs for ETH 2.0, I think we will put out a calculation that the theoretical maximum issuance will be something like 2 million per year, literally if everyone participates. But in reality, ETH 2.0 issuance will be somewhere between 100,000 and 2 million per year, most likely being you know way less than 2 million. If that amount of ETH were created today with the current total supply, as you can see here on CoinGecko, then that would be about a 1.7% uh, increase, okay? So, you know, the, the number of ETH will be higher by the time ETH 2.0 fully rolls out, but you can see here how those numbers would impact, you know, ETH's current supply today. And this checks out because the transition to Ethereum 2.0 staking mechanism is set to reduce the inflation rate of ETH to 0.5% to 2%, putting it in the same company as Bitcoin and gold in terms of supply inflation. So that's how ETH's monetary policy works now in terms of its issuance and how it's going to work in the future. Now, there's one other thing you have to understand. I talked about multiple protocol upgrades. There's another one that could cause ETH to become deflationary at times. Because Buterin also mentioned that the total circulating supply could see a net reduction at times of high transaction volume due to a portion of each fee being burnt. This is a part of EIP-1559, which is just a, pro a proposed protocol change to Ethereum. All right, So don't get too overwhelmed by the uh, technical jargon here. This is just a proposal to say, hey, we want Ethereum to work this way. And this change has a few important implications, but the one I want to focus on right now is how it affects Ethereum's monetary policy. And it has to do with the transaction fee that you pay whenever you, um, you know, send Ether or do any kind of transaction in the Ethereum network. So let's say that I send you one Ether. Um, I pay a small fee in order to do that. So it's like one ETH plus, you know, a little 0 0.0001 ETH or something like that. Okay. So in EIP-1559, that fee is broken down into two parts, a base fee and also a minor tip, okay? So in EIP-1559, part of this fee, the base fee itself can get burned. You can think about like a network fee. So everyone who holds ETH is rewarded because less ETH is being created in this transaction, okay? And so part of what he's saying is in times of really high network activity or when there's high demand, people want to pay more, that this base fee is dynamic and that the amount of ETH burned in that transaction or in this group of transactions that are included in the blocks can be bigger than the amount of ETH that's actually issued in that block to the stakers in ETH 2.0 or in the, to the miners right now in Ethereum 1.0. And so that's the important part of EIP-1559 that you need to know about. And so again, this is not here right now. This is something that I expect to change this year with Ethereum. And so to tie that all together, ETH 2.0, the migration, and also EIP-1559 together will greatly reduce the amount of ETH that's created and thus result in much less inflation than we have now. So let's go back to the idea of Ethereum as a store of value and how ETH 2.0 can fix this. So remember I said that you know Ethereum is migrating to proof of stake and the miners on the, on the network are getting replaced by validators who stake their Ethereum Ethereum cryptocurrency in order to earn that passive income reward for maintaining the network. Well, think about staking as a way to improve Ethereum as an actual store of value because it, it creates less sell pressure on the asset itself. So if much less ETH is getting created uh, under Ethereum 2.0, then people who are responsible for running the network are actually Ethereum holders that have to hold this Ethereum and stake it that's not going to be sold. And so, you know, miners, on the other hand, don't necessarily have to hold Ether in order to help maintain the network. They can just take what they have and instantly sell it. And there will be some sell pressure from people who are staking and want to sell off their passive income reward, but they still have to hold at least 32 Ether in order to do this. And you might say, well, that's going to prevent a lot of people from staking. There's still staking pools. People can stake with less Ether. And there will still be a significant portion of the ETH supply that's going to be locked into validators as a result of this, which is basically just going to reduce the circulating supply of ETH. And all these can really boost the probability that Ethereum could be used as a store of value compared to Bitcoin, which is going to stay on mining. And so let's look at one last big difference between Ethereum versus Bitcoin. So going back to what I was talking about at the beginning of the video, where people say, you know, Bitcoin is perfect. It's a hard money. It's a reliable store of value because, you know, the code can't change, right? We always know there's gonna be 21 million bitcoins in existence ever and that ethereum right you know it has 
uh, this infinite supply. The monetary policy is changing as new versions come out. And so we have to trust that Ethereum is actually going to do what they say they're going to do. It's central, all that kind of stuff. But Bitcoin, it's, it's codified into the code. It's never going to change. Always 21 million Bitcoins. We have halving cycles, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so here's what you have to think about. Have you ever stopped and asked yourself, like, what happens when all the Bitcoin gets mined, when we reach that you know 21 million number. Well, basically the Bitcoin network has to rely upon fees in order to sustain the miners. So don't forget, they're the ones that are running the network that are adding new blocks to the blockchain. They're responsible for, for basically doing everything. So miners get paid two, two ways. The network creates new Bitcoin, it's mine. That's what the miners are for. And then whenever you pay to send Bitcoin around, you, you pay a fee. And that fee is going to the miners. And so once all the Bitcoin is ever mined and we you know, get to 21 million Bitcoin or really even approach close to that number, the network is effectively going to be run off fees only, which presents a potential security risk to the Bitcoin protocol. And that's one thing people don't really like to talk about. That's one of the reasons that Ethereum actually has an infinite supply and has inflation built into the protocol forever to avoid this problem. We don't really want to be in the situation where the people running the network, well, when we go to Ethereum 2.0, it's going to be validators, not miners. But we don't want to be in a situation where the network never pays the people who are running it. And that problem could potentially happen uh, whenever Bitcoin gets to its you know maximum supply or close to it. Now, that being said, we don't anticipate the last Bitcoin being mined until 2140. So there's definitely some time to think about, you know, what they're going to do in this situation. But really, this problem of the network running off of fees or mostly running off of fees is going to happen a lot sooner than that, because as we approach that, you know, the, the it's going to take a long time for that last Bitcoin or, or so to, to actually get mined. So early in the video, when I said, don't think that the Bitcoin protocol could never be changed. Well, if security risks actually do present themselves because of this problem, then the protocol likely will need to change. And that's something that people don't really like to talk about. And that's why Ethereum has inflation built into the protocol by design. But we already have a game plan for how it's going to work for the long term. And we're going to see that roll out over the coming years rather than having to wait until there's a cliff in sight to address the problem at some later date. And so that's how Ethereum could work as a store of value. OK, so again, we're at the point in time where people are testing the hypothesis whether cryptocurrencies can work as reliable stores of value at all and whether they're better stores of value than what we have currently. You know, national currencies, gold, silver, other precious metals. And one of the big narratives behind Bitcoin is that it's the only reliable store of value. It's a hard money with a total supply that can't be changed. The protocol can't be changed. And that Ethereum will never work because it has an infinite supply. It can be printed on a whim. But that's not really true. Ethereum has inflation to it by design for security security reasons, and it follows a very predictable schedule. Now, there will be some trust to the protocol as it changes over the coming years, but that's one of the reasons there's so much potential upside with Ethereum right now is because if you get in before those changes actually take place, then you could potentially be handsomely rewarded for that. So it's not, not financial advice, not investment advice, not telling you to buy Ethereum, but that's something you have to keep into consideration. And whenever we do fully make that transition and Ethereum 2.0 is here, you know, the blockchain is ready for prime time. It's really fast, really scalable. Then Ethereum will have a very small inflation rate once we move to proof of stake, and it'll solve the long term problem of paying people to run the network and not have to address it later when you know we reach a t theoretical maximum supply that the protocol says can't change. And so for all those reasons, Ethereum looks like it could be a reliable store of value, just like Bitcoin and maybe potentially better. So that's all we got for today. As always, hope you like this video, you know, smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to this channel. And, you know, if you're as fascinated with this technology as I am and you want to learn how to become a blockchain developer, it's one of the highest paid fields in tech, then how can you get started today? You can go to my YouTube homepage. You can find any of my free courses there. They're like Udemy courses, but they're totally free. All right, I can show you how to build your own blockchain application step-by-step -step from start to finish. And if you like those, you want to take the next step, or hey, maybe you want to take a master shortcut entirely, I can show you how to become a blockchain master step-by-step -step from start to finish over at dappyuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp. You don't have to be an expert to get started today. I've helped people with zero programming background become real-world blockchain developers in a matter of months. So that's all I've got. And until next time, thanks for watching Dapp University.